<laughs> so like if the kids don't take their shoes off before getting on the dojo mat, are you like, I'll get you? There's a certain degree of security. It makes you a much calmer person if you know that you could break any six bones on the person you're talking to whenever you feel like. Kevin Halsey. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. My name is Matt Whiteside. I'm your host. Today I'm joined by Kevin Halsey, author of Midnight, the first novel of Maximus. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate your time. No problem. I'm happy to be here. Right, man. So tell me about Midnight, the first novel of Maximus. I'm looking at the cover art right now, and it's got a a silhouette of an archer aiming a bow low at something or someone or some creature possibly with a very eerie backdrop. I haven't mm-hmm. read the book. Um, I've read a little bit of the blurb. The first line is, I'm not going to die. <laughs> Tell me, this book sounds pretty intense. What's this book about? Um, the book is about... Um... The main character, Estelle, is a castaway, Robinson Crusoe style, on an island. And she finds out that she was cast away by, she was betrayed. That it wasn't an accident that put her on the island. And she decides to go back and get vengeance on the people who threw her away, who turn out to be her family. Vengeance? Yes. And with all of that, there is also... These people didn't just get rid of her because they don't like her. They were doing it to start a war for profit. So she has to stop that war now that they failed to start back then. Wow. So is this like a young adult um, fantasy? or It is a young adult fantasy. It's probably how I would describe it. Um, it's the easiest pigeonhole, at least. Okay. Is this like a – Is this? Or have you created your own world here, or is this a – it's a, um, it's a totally independent, it's a fantasy world. Um, the reason wow. I, I, had, I hedged it a little bit on that is because it draws most of its inspiration from superhero works rather than fantasy. I like that. Cool. So this, this character, the character's name is Maximus, right? The Maximus is the universe. It's the world. It's the universe. The okay. idea was a shared universe like the Marvel movies with uh. – six or seven different books or whatever, and they each have a different lead character, but it's in a shared universe, and they all interact with each other. Wow. So tell me the main, name main, the name of the main character. The name of the main character, her name is Estelle, and Midnight is the name of her superhero alter ego. So oh. like Bruce Wayne and Batman, it's Estelle and Midnight. Dude, that sounds really cool, man. And so she's the first, the first character in this series of six or seven that you have planned uh at the moment i would say roughly i've got four in mind and then there's gonna be a big team up like the avengers heck yeah dude (laughs) that sounds awesome so where did this where did this idea come from the idea for the book or the universe because it was kind of different stories yeah so let's go with uh the idea for the universe i suppose the idea for the universe was one day I was sitting back and I had all these random book ideas that I had no idea what to do with. And I was just trying to figure out something I could do with them. And it occurred to me some of the criticisms. I mean, I'm going to say the Marvel Universe again. I had seen people talk about how each of the movies is kind of disconnected from the next movie. Yeah. You know, and it occurred to me, what if you did a shared universe where you actually had the main characters regularly interacting with each other to uh-huh. alleviate some of that disconnectedness? So I thought, what if I took a bunch of my random ideas, made this shared universe, and then in each individual book, I had at least two of the major people involved, not just one, to make it really feel like we got bleed over. So we see not just um, Midnight's character in book one, but we also see the 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 introduction of another character? Yes. Midnight is the primary character, but there is another character, um, a young man, a young wizard that she meets, and his origin story takes place at the same time. He's the second book. Ah, so it, it's like it, it bleeds into his origin story, kind of yes. like how uh, how they did Daredevil and um, in the Punisher and the Netflix, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Netflix series kind of deal. Yes, 
he uh, he has a bit of a subplot and he's important in Midnight, but then he gets his own book. He gets promoted to the star role in the That's second cool. book. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So let's talk about Midnight because I think I mean the character itself, the the artwork, like I said, looks great. Did you do your own cover art here? I did not do my cover art. I I uh, draw terrible stick people, so I I can't do any cover art. I have a, a very talented. <laughs> artist that i was hooked up with uh, and she uh, she did all of that so so let's let's talk about midnight what what are her i mean she's got a bow and arrow like what are her uh her powers if you can talk about those midnight's powers she's um i mean the easiest way to describe would say she's like batman she doesn't really okay. have powers Okay. It's a little hard to say because there is something she does kind of have, but it's not what you call a, a power power. It's like a, a mental technique, state of mind, something or the other. But it's part of that split between Estelle and Midnight, the yeah, the superhero versus non superhero identity. There's more of like a sight or a heightened sense of things, and... something like that. Yes. Okay. She is, is she rich? She's a like... Archer, but that is that is mostly that's skill, that's training. Okay. And they they just marooned her on this island to... The plan was to kill her. But yeah. um, this one person who was one of her guards realized the plan and got her off the ship, and she wound up shipwrecked instead. Okay. So it sounds like the, the idea for the universe brought about, about the books, right? Yes. The, the individual book idea was one I'd had separately, and um, okay. it, it changed a lot. But working it into the Maximus universe is what really made it actually happen. It was just a vague idea in my head before I had the universe concept. Okay. Now, Kevin, let's talk about this, man, because you're you're creating these superheroes with these awesome fighting capabilities, right? Yes. You yourself are a fighting machine. Is that correct? Depends on who you ask. Uh, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I'd say yes. <laughs> Okay, but I mean, like, you don't just accidentally get a, a third-degree black belt, right? <laughs> no, that's not something you just trip over something on the street and get a third-degree black belt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember I was a purple belt in karate, Joe Corley karate here in Atlanta. It took me three years when I was a kid to get a purple belt. I can only imagine a third-degree black belt. Like, that's... <laughs> you obviously yeah, had to put it in some work. My first black belt I got in four years, uh, and uh, it's been nine years now, and I just got my third degree. Um, back in October. So, did you take did you take any of your martial arts training from your life and put it into the books? And it's, uh, it's interesting. It's actually a symbiotic. It's both ways is where the relationship goes. Yes, yeah. I certainly did. It, knowing martial arts has helped me choreograph really good fight scenes and know a lot of how you actually teach someone martial arts because that's yeah. my role as a teacher. But the other, the other interesting part is in choreographing those fight scenes and coming up with these ideas, it stretches my brain and makes me think about what would I do if this happened or if I was up against a, someone with this superpower. And it, it, it actually makes me a better fighter as a martial artist in real life as well, which is something yeah. that I don't think many people would think actually works that way. Yeah. That's it's neat. I mean, if you're thinking about how to stop like somebody with arm cannons or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you'll never run into that situation, knock on wood, in real well, life. Yeah. But it makes you it stretches your brain and helps you think about what you can do, what you can't do. Yeah, definitely. And I'm always interested in this too. Any type of superhero movie, any type of hero journey, there's always a lot of introspection that goes on. Right? Um, and it's not just the character themselves, but I, but like for the the author too. There's there's a, a depth that we have to go to. Did you learn stuff about yourself that you didn't know while writing this? Um, some some things, yes. Um, I learned that I do have a certain uh, bit of a vengeful streak in me, which is one of those <laughs> things. You know, it's, it's helpful to you know acknowledge those things about yourself because you gotta keep a lid on it so, so like if the kids don't take their shoes off before getting on the dojo mat are you like i'll get you <laughs> <laughs> not usually it takes a bit more than that to set me off but once i'm <laughs> set off i don't go back <laughs> like so that you, so you finish the job job it's like uh that movie um law-abiding citizen yeah yeah 
I start the job, I finish it. I want to get on your bad side. Jeez Louise. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to get on my bad side. It's just once you do, it's hard to get off my bad side. You're, you're a pretty jovial guy. I try to be. I really do. Yeah. So well, I would say uh, there's actually one line in the book that's taken straight from my experience as a martial artist, and that's just yeah. – uh, reflecting there, there's a certain degree of security it makes you a much calmer person if you know that you could break any six bones on the person you're talking to whenever you feel like it i was gonna ask like it doesn't it, so it, bone density doesn't matter like strength of other the other person would it matter like i got some pretty big arms how easily could you snap my arm <laughs> depends on where i hit it that's right i wouldn't i wouldn't be going for your forearm the elbow is a very weak point yeah you just force it the wrong way yeah yeah I could, I could go into a lot more detail i'm just not sure how much you want to hear <laughs> no i i'm gonna start doing I, i'm gonna go do some curls after this interview to make sure my, <laughs> make sure my biceps are good and strong <laughs> just in case you never know man that's <laughs> no you right. never do that's a very interesting fact i'm i'm glad we learned that about you that uh it's good. It's it's good for future fans who uh, come to your book signings and try to <laughs> who decide they want to rush the, rush the stage or something. <laughs> give me your give me an autograph. <laughs> That's right. <sighs> it might it might not work out so well. <laughs> yeah. Now they know, man. Now they know. They'll, they'll watch this first. We'll put Thanks. out we'll put out a PSA. <laughs> start break start breaking elbows. <laughs> Uh, Man, well, I'm also I'm also six foot five, so I'm uh, not sure I'd have to break elbows on a lot of people. Just yeah, they just would never approach. <laughs> the approach would never happen. No. So let's talk about the book some more. So midnight. How long did it take you from inception of the idea to actually produce the the content and get it written? Two three months, somewhere around that. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly how much. There are a couple of other books that I've done where I know like down to the day, like it took this amount of days. But this one was uh, about two months or so. But that yeah. was back in 2016, um, early 2016. And yeah. it only only published this January. So. so you put a lot of time into editing and book cover and format. Definitely. I revised it a couple of times. I passed it around to... A bunch of my friends, um, I have an editor that uh, went through the book with a fine-tooth comb, and I launched it in January because, you know, three years, probably okay. But like most authors, I imagine, I can still look at it and say, I would change this if I was rewriting it again. Maybe I should have changed this. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially, I mean, if you keep writing, it's like you're, you're, your craft gets better over time. It always oh, yeah. does. Go back and I go back and look at some of the stuff I wrote, like, two months ago and i'm like what the heck is <laughs> what was i doing yeah, yeah. and uh part of that with midnight um one thing that i point out to people who talk about the writing craft in that is that there are no dialogue tags in the story or almost no i'm not going to say no and that's like he said she said he growled oh, yeah. she yeah there's, there's almost none of those that's a bold move cotton <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was a conversation my editor and I had, and she pointed out that the purpose of a dialogue tag is only to notify the reader who said what. Right. And if you know your paragraphing and your structuring of all of that, you can make that obvious even without the yeah. he said whatever. And things like tone, like you know, he shouted or she mumbled, you can make that more obvious and more immediate to the reader with description rather than just a quick one word. Right. I'm, I'm proud yeah, from takes, my soapbox, but that's one of the things I'm proud of about the book. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. I, I mean, in uh, I think Stephen King's book on writing, he talks about using tags like that, and I mean, it takes skill to not to be able to not use them. I think because I know for me, it was like I use them with everything because I'm just mm -hmm. I didn't know how to necessarily write it and without getting the reader confused, like how because. There, you have to actually make that that line, that sentence, whatever that person's saying, so distinctly that person's voice that you know that oh, you don't have to say he said, she said. So that right. takes talent, man. It definitely does, and there there are some there are some cheat codes and tricks to the trade, but please divulge all your all your codes. <laughs> well, the, easy, the easiest trick on that one is just um, 
whenever you have a character give a line of dialogue, write them doing an action. And if you put that in the same paragraph, then the reader immediately draws the connection that it's the same character. Like if you write, um, go away, he turned and walked for the door. The reader instantly connects that that's, that's the same, the action and the dialogue are coming from the same person. Oh. That's what I meant when I said, if you know you're paragraphing and stuff. But yeah, trust yeah. me, that's not like it's not like I was born knowing that, and I have so many old manuscripts that are cluttered up. But yeah, so this this wasn't your first first attempt at writing. You've written oh, a lot. Of- I have been writing on and off since I was six years old. Wow. Um, I finished my first book when I was sixteen, and that's eight years ago now. Um, it's hard for me to describe how many books I have because it all depends on, do you count an unfinished product? Do you count a fan fiction? What do you count? <laughs> well, I guess if it's read, like if the story's complete, but if like, if it's not edited fully, then I think mm-hmm. you can still count it, right? I mean, if it's, but if, this, if it's the intact story, I think you can count it. I would put it in the ballpark of 20 to 25 books then. Holy crap. Is what I but you I haven't know, published I'm not, any I'm other saying ones. They're all readable. I'm saying they exist. Sure. Yeah. Well, they're not in like unknown alien languages, so I'm sure they're readable. <laughs> they, they're, they've got to be readable, unless they some, are some in unknown alien languages. Uh, hang on a second. You're breaking up a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, say that again. I said, are some of these in unknown alien languages? Uh, unless you count my like when I make typos and stuff, no. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't that. speak alien. Uh, I've let that go since my high school days. <laughs> the Klingon. <laughs> did, did I wasn't speak? in AT Alien or anything no. like that. <laughs> no, me neither. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. You've written close to twenty five books, but this is the first one that you've actually published. That's true. Yeah. What Mostly was it about this? I, what was it about this story that was so much different? Well, like, why didn't you? Did you? Did it just have more appeal it, to you? It had a wider scope. Was the biggest thing. Like I said, it was the the shared universe concept. Yeah. It, it was just me thinking traditional publishing. You, know, you put out even at your fastest. I've never seen an author put out more than one or a book a year or something like that. Unless it's Stephen King. He's in, he's in a league with him. But with this. Here, like I've described the the first five books or whatever that I had right there, and those are by no means the only books I have planned because there's going to be individual sequels to various people. Like I conceived a project on the scale of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I felt like I probably would want to manage the pace and feel of all of that personally. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible, man. (laughs) I mean, to to have a vision of this many books... You know, and to be able to put that plan into action and start moving on it. Like, and then this took, you know, you said it took two, three months to write, but then it just came out this, you said January of last year or January of this year. Of this year. So it's, it's a very new release. Was there any thought to trying to um, go, go get an agent and get it published a traditional route? Or were you like, I'm just going to do it myself the whole way? This book in particular? Um, yeah. It was this book was always I conceived of it as on my own, just because of again the scale of the project. I just thought that an agent signing on to, you know, what could easily be twenty or thirty books. I just thought that might be a little, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. might be too much. Whereas I do have other projects that I'm pursuing agents and traditional representation for, but okay. But I can't talk about those. I have to kill you. <laughs> top secret. And you could kill me if he's so true. <laughs> okay. Understood. Understood. Um, have you, have, so have you actually done the querying process for any of them? Like, have you sent out letters to agents? I, yeah. have, uh, I have done an awful lot of querying. I have a whole folder on my hard drive of rejected queries. Nice. How that, how's that feel? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> It feels great. I, I've, I've had kicks to the crotch that hurt less. <laughs> really? Have you have yeah. you uh, sent back letters with the uh, stick figure drawings of broken elbows? <laughs> no. In fact, I usually send back thank you notes. Yeah, if that's good, takes right? Time to even send me a rejection. You know, half the time when you send to an agent, you don't get anything at all back if they're not interested. So if someone takes the time to send me a rejection letter, 
I send back, you know, thanks for your time and consideration. No hard feeling. You, you have a great day. Uh, a letter yeah. pretty much like that. And I get, I, I go, I make a longer, more personal letter the further along the process I got. Yeah. That's what I, I mentioned that on Twitter to somebody a little while back, but it was like, well, at least, you know, you're not invisible. You know, you got the, like, half the time, if you don't get anything back, it's like, do I even exist? Like, is anybody even seeing my stuff? You just got to keep going, right? Just keep trying. And you, and you can't tell whether you vanished into the internet or been rejected right. a, a couple times. You know, I even had one time I sent a query to an agent, never got a reply, and I figured, oh, he rejected me. And I sent a quick check-in letter, like, four months later, because I had a suspicion I might have messed up the email, and he requested the full that day. Oh, wow. So you never can tell with these, right? Yeah, these follow up, follow up's important. It's all it's all about follow up and relationship, right? Like trying to make sure you keep and build a relationship with even the yeah. ones, like you said, those thank you notes are. There's only ever one time I've been rejected from a query that I did not send a thank you note. Well, I've, I have not sent thank you notes plenty of times, but there's only one time that it was like I actively did it because I was tipped. And I'm not <laughs> going to talk about that because I don't want I don't want to talk about the negative stuff. There's one time that it ticked me off, but that's not because I got rejected. It was to, it was for other reasons. Yeah. Send a no thank you note. No thank <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> not quite. I got you. That's awesome, man. Um, so I wanted to get into some other stuff. I want to play a game. You don't know what this game is? Not a clue. Because I didn't warn you before <laughs> before we started recording. Absolutely not. But I'm, I'm totally I am unprepared. I'm let, me find, side let me find my game notebook. I am also prepared. Not prepared. <laughs> oh, so you're the Batman. <laughs> I'm Batman? Oh, here it is. <laughs> I know I had it here somewhere. Kevin Halsey. Are you ready to play? 20 questions lightning round. Oh, boy. Okay, let's see what we got here. All right. The object of this game is to get to know you better by you answering the questions as fast as possible without using your brain to think. Okay, that shouldn't be hard. Use your face to think instead. <laughs> All right. All right, you ready? Let's do this. Favorite sound? Music. Favorite person? My wife. Favorite sport? Martial arts, I guess. Favorite food? Tacos. <laughs> Favorite song? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's harder, but I'm just going to say anything by Taylor Swift. Favorite movie? Ooh, Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Name of first love? Kehlani. First words? Cheese. I'm <laughs> not making is... that up. Cheese? Cheese. <laughs> What's the loudest noise you've ever heard? Airplane taking off. Favorite memory? Marrying my wife. Shoes? Um, I guess. Arm? I don't what? Arm? Arm? Arm, arm, um, break. <laughs> Battleships. Cool. Country music. Yes. Fishing. No. Roller derby. No. Ice cream. Yeah, it depends on the ice cream. Beans. Beans? No. Ew. Turtle. I don't think I should say uh, a person popped in my head, and I don't think I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> that was 20 questions lightning round with Kevin Halsey. Kevin, great job, man. Oh, yay. <laughs> Do I get You're a trophy? A total I am a pro. Total pro. <laughs> really, really impressive. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you think so. Oh, yeah, it was great, man. So... Back to our normally scheduled uh, randomness. <laughs> what? So, do you have like a process for writing every day? Do you? Because it sounds like you write a ton. I mean, you've got a lot of projects in there, and you've also got a lot of stuff you've already written. How do you write every single day? 
I uh, try to. I'm not one of those people. I don't have like a day plan, like, you know, from 10 to 12, I write. I usually, what I do is I get up and I, I get to my computer. I do all my normal morning stuff. I like, you know, check all the news, Facebook, ignore all the stuff that, about my family that I don't want to hear about, things yeah. like that. <laughs> and then Sorry. I usually try and sit and write because if I, even if I, if I try to cheat and I just like, okay, I'm just going to play video games today, I usually feel terrible because I want to have gotten something done. So yeah. I usually sit there and I try to write until either I reach a certain progress point or if like after 30, 45 minutes, I realize I've been scrolling on the internet the whole time, it's probably not happening. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not coming out. So. Yeah, it's not going to come out. Well, isn't it? It's, it's difficult, right, when you're just in a mode of taking in information all the time, especially with like news, news and right. Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds. It's like hard to actually produce anything outward like writing content. It, it's, it makes it hard sometimes, but it also it helps to have that constant influx of information because all fiction is is ana analyzing real life through this fictional lens. So I often, I've, I've described it as uh, the appeal of fantasy is that you can take the problems and issues of real life and you can blow them up to a scale they don't exist at, and then you can solve them and help helps you process them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Did you did you do that with this book? Did you solve some problems in your own life? Virtually every one of my books, I'm going to say this, virtually every single one, the main character is a younger child with several siblings. And I am the youngest of five. And I'm one you of can five see too. that there might be some issues to work through in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm the I'm number four um, of five, major, so major, I understand that big family thing, man. A major uh, character in Midnight is actually her sister, her older uh -huh. sister, who has a bit of a um. I'm not gonna spoil it, but there is there are hints that she could be a villain, could not be a villain. There's kind of a revolving door situation there, and yeah. a large part of the story is trying to figure out whose side she's actually on. And that was there was plenty of ground there for me to work out some of my own sibling problems. <laughs> trying to figure out if they were on your side or against you your whole life. Yeah, trying to figure out if you know, are you with me or are you putting me down because I don't get this really. <laughs> yeah, how much of it is, is it sibling rivalry and how much of it is just pure hatred? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> That's true, man. There's a you have. Yes, I have. <laughs> It's helped you work through it, though, huh? It's helped me work through it. Um, this book and several of my others, because like I said, virtually any one of my books, you pick it up and there's a distinct undertone of family, especially siblings. Yeah. This one has it. Probably the second book, the one after this, does not have that undertone like at all, which is weird. The, um, the second book is, uh, uh, again, I don't want to talk too much about that, but it's much yeah. At the same time, it's lighter and darker. It's weird because the main character of that book is probably the most well-adjusted main character I've ever written. Because I normally yeah. write people who like, have daddy issues and siblings that are evil and <laughs> traumatic backstories. And this guy is just a totally well-adjusted, normal small-town yeah. boy. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, uh, it's very, very different. It's like going about enjoying his life? Nothing, no no issues? Um yeah, he kind of, like a small town boy, he's suddenly in, in this big, big um, magic university. It's pretty much where he is in the second book. So I know you don't want to go too much into the second book, so we'll focus on the first one. So how right. have you? How has the first one been received so far? Um, so far, the reviews have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and that's, you know, my mother didn't leave a review, so that's not why. But... <laughs> Moms sometimes aren't the best, man, because my mom tried to leave a four-star review on my book, and I was like, what are you doing? She's like, I don't give five-star reviews. I was like, jeez. That's what my mother told me. My mother didn't leave a review, but you know, she went on, on Amazon. She didn't. On Goodreads, she left a review, and it was four stars. And she told me, well, I'd only leave five stars if I would buy it. She's like, she man, moms are, moms are tough, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, all, all the reviews have been four or five stars, and I will take that to the bank, yeah, <laughs> that is my opinion on that. Um, and several of them have been from people, like a couple of them are from people I know, 
like my wife reviewed it. He gave it four stars. But, she gave it four. Are you like what the heck are you doing? <laughs> I read I read some of the reviews on Amazon and they're all great. Like the reviews are like this is amazing, like amazing book, amazing work, like great world building, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like four stars. I'm like, you didn't have any issues with it. why are you why are you giving four stars? I didn't get I don't get that at all. It doesn't make any I'm sense. Not to me. A one star review. I'm I'm kind of okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're doing, you're doing some good stuff, though. I like to think so. Uh, I hope other people agree. Yeah. I, I'm going to check it out uh, for sure. But um, so in terms of, like, your goals and aspirations, I mean, you've been writing since you were six years old. You Have you always seen yourself as a future, um, you know, number one best-selling author? Yes. Okay. I um I would describe it, and it's maybe overly wordy. My wife likes to laugh at me when I say this, but I describe it as um, I have known what God put me on the planet to do since I was six years old. Wow. I've, I've never been one of those people that like I stand there like I have no idea what to do. It's always been I don't know how to do the thing that I have to do. Yeah, like how to make it? How to make it come to fruition? Right, and that's gotten me into all kinds of messes with my family before. <laughs> <laughs> Still, the accountant, da, 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 da. No, <laughs> dude. Seriously, like it's it's hard, like trying to trying to walk the path that you know you're supposed to walk when everyone around you is like, but this is what we think you should be doing. And you're like, but that's oh, yeah. not. I understand, but that's not. <laughs> no, I, totally. I can sit back and be like, yeah, they all they none of them were like malicious, and they were all just giving me the best advice they knew how. But you know, yeah. four older siblings, both of my parents, all these family friends, and they're all telling me, "You're an idiot." <laughs> yeah, so Albert Einstein quote about uh, if you ask a fish to climb a tree, you'll yeah. never know it's or something something like that. You'll never oh, know it's oh, true genius. Yeah, I got it. It's true though, man. Like it, it's hard to walk a path that we're not made to walk. I mean, if you're not, if you're supposed to be writing and you're sitting in an office job as an accountant, <laughs> like it doesn't really mesh. It's so yeah, I have. Weird. I did actually discover I'm I'm pretty good at engineering, and that doesn't sound at all. My dad's a an engineer, mechanical engineer, okay. and I was helping him out with his business, and he actually sent me to a course on how to do you know 3D modeling software. Yeah. Um. Uh, to design parts and stuff. Um, he was just sending me through that so I could do tweaks to stuff he designed. But I actually went to that course and they didn't find out I wasn't an engineer. The five day course, it was day four that they figured that out. Because on day four, they handed me a bunch of, they handed everyone a bunch of blueprints and said, model these. And it's all full of engineering jargon and symbols. And there were nine blueprints. I got through seven of them before I had to go to the instructor and say, what the hell does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, dude. Well, it's good to know I'm, you have, I'm proud of it. It's good to know you have options. Yeah. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is I was the best student in that course because everyone else in the course was like 80 years old and didn't know how to use a computer. <laughs> so the, you had an immediate I'm not like kidding. A, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest questions being asked in the course was what's the difference between a left and a right mouse click? Seriously? Yeah. Oh. And meanwhile, I'm sitting over here just like, I have, all these people have engineering degrees and everything. They know all the stuff, but. <laughs> I guess there's a lot of creativity in engineering too. I mean, you have to, you have to have a, a creative mind to be an engineer yeah. because you're molding and creating things with numbers and algorithms and all kinds. I mean, you're not, there's, there's definitely creativity involved. It's just different. It's a different, yeah, Totally. I mean, I never got the chance to really design anything, but, you know, I don't know anything about engineering, so I'd design a part and it would, like, break. <laughs> right. So is it is it just writing, though, for you that's, like, your go-to source of, of creative outlet? For the most part, um, yeah, I can't think of anything else I really do other than, you know, play a couple of video games. That's not really a creative outlet. That's following a story someone else put together. Yeah, I actually it's, had it's like time. immersive storytelling. Yeah, but I also I also get to that point where I will like if I have a story idea in my head and like I'm being lazy and I'm not writing and I'm like playing a game or whatever, I will get pissed at the game because I will sit there and be like, 
why would I be interested in this story that I didn't write that I can't control as opposed to <laughs> yeah something you can't no, it does. It does make sense. And let's. I want to talk about that too because when are you are you somebody who plots out everything they do, or are you somebody who kind of goes with the flow of what you're feeling at the moment? I think if I had to pick one of the two, I would say I'm a plotter. But yeah. uh, honestly, I think I fall somewhere in the middle because I'm not one of those people who sits back and I like have a writer's bible that's like ten thousand words long for the uh, the Maximus books for as an example. All of them have the exact same formulaic outline. Like I have a three act structure with like with eleven chapters in each act. I'm not saying every one is the same length. That's my outline yeah. document. And then I write a one sentence little. This is what happens in this chapter. A quick little summary. Boom. Next chapter. Next chapter. Because I figure if I write it all down in the outline, why would I write it in the book? Yeah, that's true. There it's are saved, entire save you time. There are entire subplots in Midnight that aren't even referenced in the outline just because of all of that. Because they were in my head and the outline just was like a quick little description of, you know, what happens in this chapter. It's one quick sentence. Is this all stuff you've picked up just by uh, writing and, and learning yourself? Or it's all, it's all self-taught knowledge in terms of outlines of and writing? Yeah. Except some of the bits about... Like when I mentioned that with dialogue tags and all that, you know, my editor has had a big influence on me in the last year since I met her. But okay. she's the only writing mentor I've ever really had. Okay. So up until pretty much exactly one year ago, this was all self-taught. Oh, wow. So, well, let's talk about inspirations then. So who was it that inspired you to, when you were reading books as a child, young adult like what was some of the stuff that you were falling in love with that you were like i want to write this the very first book that made me have that reaction and again i was six years old it was brian jake's red wall my mother started reading it to me and my brother and that was i fell in love you know the little woodland creatures and their war against evil and the, all the storytelling and I, I i knew that was this was what i wanted to do tell stories yeah and then as i got Older, you know, The Hobbit, um, Aragon was another big one. Um, and some of the Star Wars expanded universe novels. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm in the minority, but I will never, I, I hated episode seven. I will never forgive them for making the new Star Wars movies. <laughs> I yeah. liked the books, man. <laughs> you liked the what? I liked the books, the Star Wars expanded universe books, like the X Wing books and all of that. Oh, okay. But then Star Wars, The Force Awakens, I thought it was terrible. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I haven't seen it. I oh, haven't seen, okay. I haven't seen any of the new one, like the very the newest ones, the seven, eight, nine. I haven't seen yeah. those. I've been meaning to. It's just there's so much there's so much of everything to see. <laughs> oh, definitely. There's you know? a lot out there. Yeah. But my my opinion of episode seven is that it's uh it's uh, it's a perfectly nice made for TV Star Wars knockoff. That's really? pretty much my opinion of it. <laughs> Dang, <laughs> acting is great. Characters are fine. It's just yeah. it's not Star Wars. <laughs> is that the one with uh, what's his name? The guy who's got like a really big chest and he's the he's a bad Jedi. Not a bad Jedi, but um. Uh, there was a me. There was a meme of him on the internet for a long time. Yeah, I, yeah, that's. Yes. About his man boobs, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think I know who you're talking about. Yes, and, uh, I think that's right. The guy that's with the, the first table. Yeah, that's just the only thing that came into my mind because I haven't seen the movie. Don't well, hate us not much, but that's me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that book. What, what else was it? Was there anything else that kind of stuck out as you were growing up um, that made you want to continue down this road as a writer? That like. Because I know there are multiple times for me that I had to like remind myself that yeah, you're this you, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what you're supposed to be doing, kind of deal. Right. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of like the, the the usual classics I could say, like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. But in, yeah. in the interest to be a little bit less generic, no um, cliches, man. That's like Grace <laughs> Terabithia. Um, it's oh. a YA book, and I really like that one. Yeah. Um, uh, and more recently speaking, Susan Denard's Truth Witch, I really enjoyed. Truth um, Witch? 
Truth Witch. It's a, um, I'm not sure if it's young adult or adult, technically speaking, but it's a yeah. fantasy novel. Um, and Susan Denard, she uh, does an awful lot of helping uh, new writers um, through Twitter and her newsletter. So I really approve of her as a person a lot. And <laughs> I like Truth Witch. I'm going to say it was one of those oh, things that, it was, it was one of those things that, like, I had some problems with the book that, like, uh, but every book has its issues. So yeah. it wasn't, like, not a terrible book. It was just a book that left me a bit confused. Would you but, give uh, it a four or a five star, though? I would Kevin. say a four. <laughs> if I gave it a five, it would have to be just because Susan Denard is so helpful to all writers have and you, everything. Have you ever re- given a book a bad review? No. I uh, don't normally leave reviews at all. Uh, in most cases, but I don't, I don't leave bad reviews or whatever. And if you're talking about recommending to friends or whatever, there have been plenty of books that I've been like, don't read this. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you keep it to yourself and like in your friends. Yeah, that's good. I think that's. Well, that's I, I, I definitely, I don't want to be the guy that in the writing community they're all like, oh, it's that guy. Yeah. <laughs> if I, if if that's going to be the case, I want to be, oh, it's that guy who sends the thank you notes. That's right. Yeah, be that guy. Exactly. That's exactly. a much better guy to be. <laughs> it's a healthier way to live. Plus, there's there there really are so many great books. It's like, it's not it's and there's so many cool stories. I don't think necessarily it's like it's just massively written poorly or anything like that. But maybe a story just doesn't ring true with with me in some degree. Right. You know, is more the case than anything else that I don't enjoy a book. It's not because it's poorly written or anything like that. It's just it doesn't not, ring. It's not, doesn't ring. it's not for me, man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't have the spark. <laughs> it doesn't have the spark. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, in I want to I want to uh, ask this too. In terms of your legacy, when you're done, and I know a lot of people want to be able to write their entire life, but like. When you're all done with all of this, what do you want your legacy to be like after you're gone? My legacy, uh, I'm going to have to divert real quick onto a personal anecdote for just a second to explain yes. where I'm coming from. My okay. wife had a very um, lonely childhood for a lot of reasons I'm not going to get into, but she had like no real friends and was kind of cooped up. If you've ever seen the movie Tangled, then uh, yeah, that was her. Um, okay. and pretty wow. much books were her only outlet. And I want to be, I want to reach out and touch people that I've never met. I want yeah. someone to pick up one of my books and re- and realize, you know, I'm not alone. There is somebody else who understands what it's like to, to not fit in, to be kind of tossed around a bit. Mm. Someone who can empathize and ease some of these problems. I, I sound like I'm trying to be such a superhero great guy, but I just I want to I want to touch people because I've seen what happens when there are people who are completely abandoned. You might say. Yeah. No, okay. that's a. It's, <laughs> no, you don't. You don't sound like you're trying to be any. I mean, that's. I mean, that's exactly why I want to do it too. Because I want people not to not feel alone. I want. I want to give them the same feeling that I had. It's like that. Uh, you being able to go into a world where you feel like you belong finally. Yes, and yeah. that's that's exactly why I do it for the people who don't fit in in the real world. That's right. We jump into books. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's beautiful, man. Um, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, is that if there was anything else you wanted to tell the writing community um, before we finished up here? Uh, not terribly. Um, I'm not usually much for like you know big fancy words and everything, except when I'm writing. You know, out loud is different. Um, how long how long have you been on twitter for uh are you asking how long i've had the account or how long i've used the account because that's just been actively using twitter i have been actively using twitter for about three years i made the account when i was like 16 and i mean and then i used it for like three weeks and i never touched it again until i came back like older and wiser and like i want to build an online presence (laughs) And then delete go. all my old tweets because you know teenagers. Yeah, we say the dumbest things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> teenagers Can't are idiots. Teenager. That's you know I that's was an idiot when I was a teenager. <laughs> I was an idiot all the way up until like 
eight months ago, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still an idiot. I was an idiot earlier today. It's like, oh, just ask my wife. She'll tell you all kinds of what an idiot I am. Absolutely. That's the thing, man. Are you, uh, are you pretty um, active on Facebook and Twitter, though? Um, I go through spells, um, and usually when I stop being active, it's because I've started writing and I don't see the point in writing a tweet so much as, you know, I'm writing in my book. I'm going to be writing, <laughs> if that yeah. makes sense. No, it it's does make sense. Like, my, like, girlfriend gets, like, my girlfriend gets on me all the time. She's like, if you would, if you would have spent as much time writing as you have tweeting, you could have written a whole nother book by now. I'm like, shut up. You don't know what I'm <laughs> You don't know what I'm trying to do with my life. <laughs> you don't know my struggle. <laughs> you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> it is. It's important though to have that online presence, especially especially with trying to get publishers nowadays. It's like they look for people with online presence. To and and I don't know too much about the mechanics of any of that. I, I my my general philosophy is control what I can and if I can't yeah. so that's that's much easier said than done but <laughs> absolutely yeah it's nice though to think about <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> that's great man well Kevin uh, I want to thank you so much Kevin Halsey for coming on the Uniweb interview show Midnight the first novel of Maximus is out now I'm going to put links in the description to where you can buy it and all your uh, your social media so people can come and, and follow you. Uh, thanks again for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for putting the links in and everything. I really appreciate all of this. And to yes. anyone who's watching this video, keep being awesome. <laughs> keep being awesome. There you go, man. All right, brother. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?